Oh, here we go. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. And um, this session will be recorded. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, it's just Rob at SQL Tigers. Or you can go to my little blog, SQLTigers.com. Um, I'm going to post it, the, the video on the website and at SQL Pass. So you can get it either site. Today we have Ike Ellis. He's joining us. He's going to give a talk on Document DB. So we'll go to the next slide. So Pass has a lot of virtual chapters, many, many chapters. And I encourage you to, you know, just to see what's out there. And they're always having free webinars. And there's a lot of great topics. And here's a listing of some of the uh, chapters here. I think all of them, actually. And uh, log in, and you'll be able to sign up for their chapter and get see what they're doing and get on a webinar and see some great sessions. I'm in charge of one of those chapters. Oh, you are? Let's go back. That's right. The reading one. Well, if I can go back. Yeah. Is it the reading one? Uh, what's yeah, it's the it? reading one. Book yeah. readers. The book readers. So I yeah. has a, a, a chapter two. So uh, I, I do. And, and the book we're reading right now is Grant Fitchie's book, which is um, SQL Server Query Performance Tuning in SQL 2014. Oh, that's a great, that's got to be a great one. It's a great book. It's his fourth edition of that book. He's joining us for some of our meetings. And um, all you have to do is if you go to the book reader site, if you just go to bookreaders.sequelpass.org, you could sign up. And um, we've only read the first like five chapters together. That's only hardware. And you could skip that. If you just pick up the book and read. Now we're going to talk about reading query execution plans and indexing and covering indexes and all the good things stuff will be the next meeting in March. So you can get that book today and start reading and join us in March if you'd like. It's not too late. Well, I'm going to join. I, I should have joined by now, but I'm going to definitely join. because that's. Uh, I met Grant at Pass, and he's a great guy, very knowledgeable. So Super nice. Yeah. Super nice, and he will answer every email, and just a great guy, yeah. We'll go to the next slide here. So um, the Business Analytics Conference. So um, Pass is having this conference in April, and they gave me a code in, at the bottom of the screen. It's B-A-V-C-A-R, and I believe it's $150 you'll save off the registration fee if you use that code. So uh, that'll save you a little money. I'm speaking at that conference. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's awesome. I am. I'm speaking. Yeah. My, my topic is 60 reporting tips in 60 minutes. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's like a, a tip a minute. A tip a minute. That's a bold <laughs> statement, isn't it? Yes. Just <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> pretty cool. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so PASS is always looking for volunteers, and if you want to volunteer, here's their link. It's volunteers.sequelpass.org. And on my last slide I have today, um, if if you know someone that, and you think they're doing a great job, uh, PASS likes to recognize them and so volunteer you know just send them an email saying um you know someone you know if they're doing great you think they're just helping out get something out of it shoot them an email at the volunteer recognition at sequelpass.org and um i know they like to see it uh i actually uh last month someone really enjoyed our webinar and sent a sent a nice letter it was really nice it made it you know makes it all worthwhile to hear that uh you know what you're doing really matters and we're not paid are we rob no, absolutely not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is all absolutely free on our own time, yeah. so it's pretty amazing that you know every month we do it. So it's, but it, but it, it's a great feeling, isn't it, Ike? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know what? I love pass. You know, pass is, pass has come from a place where I came to to learn and be better at my job, and it's turned into a community of friends that I rely on and like to keep up with. And yeah, it's a great organization. I can't speak enough about it. I met you through Pass, and uh, yeah, and we we had. I mean, it's just great, you know. A lot of friends, and uh, I can't say enough about it. So, okay, I, I'm gonna go ahead and change it back to you, Ike. Yeah, so, turning it, it over to you, and we're gonna make it happen. Sure. Yeah, let's make it happen. Okay. So, um, this is an introduction to Document DB. I'm not John Ackerman. I'm actually Ike Ellis. John co-wrote this presentation with me. Um, and John, since John wrote all the code, you know, I still give him credit on the slide deck because he did write a lot of the code, but we, we kind of wrote it together. Um, we own a little software studio. John's in Phoenix. Um, and I actually own two software studios. I own one in Phoenix, which is called The Monastery, and I own one in San Diego, which is called Crafting Bytes. And we, um, 
we just kind of take in projects and we do them and then we hand value back to our customers and we're not like we're not like recruiters right like or maybe a contractor shop where you would hire a developer and that developer would go on site you know we we don't let our developers go on site we it's a studio system where you know you you ask us to do something and we do it so that's my coding background i'm also a sql server mvp i've spoken at sql pass on software development ALM with the database where I talked about database source control and continuous integration and testing and deployment um, and I've spoken at a lot of SQL Saturdays and code camps and um, I've spoken at this group before actually a year ago this month I think I spoke at this group. Uh, that um, sounds right. Um, yeah. It really does. I mean I just took over the chapter for a few months. I went to pass. I met you and you, you came on. It was great. So thank you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So this isn't strictly a SQL topic. Um, this is a data topic. DocumentDB is a data offering for, um, for Microsoft on the Azure platform. This is a cloud-only offering. There is no local DocumentDB that I know of. Maybe they keep talking about it. People keep asking for it. I think maybe one day we might see it. I don't know. Um, I do talk to the DocumentDB product team guys a lot, and they play their roadmap. Um, kind of they tightly control it but but I will tell you one thing about the document DB team and that is even though this is a in preview and I should say that right now this the, what I'm about to show you is all in preview um, they will support it for production if you ask them and they are they will listen to you like Ryan and John and those guys if you email them they'll email you back they're really responsive they really want to see people use this and I've seen them be very polite to a lot of people, and they they know the limitations of this offering. By the way, um, they're very well aware of it. So, it and they're changing it, and they're putting a lot of money into it. So, I the reason why I'm telling you all these things is because even though this product is in preview, I think that you can consider it for production projects, knowing one that it's not going to go away. Because, you know, we've all seen these Microsoft projects just go away, right? And, and I don't think this one's going to go away. And two, that um, they know your concerns and that this product is just going to continually get better and better. You know, they're, they're committed to making this product compete. So, um, but, you know, still in preview and all the regular things that go on with preview, meaning, you know, things are going to get updated and, Maybe you're not going to get told about the updates to the last minute and, you know, things like that. You, you guys know. You've used preview products before. So this demonstration, this lecture was meant to take somebody with a data background, like a relational data background, and kind of bring you up to speed on DocumentDB and show you some code so that you can get kind of somewhat comfortable with what is happening here. So what is DocumentDB? Well, in order to talk about DocumentDB, we first have to go back and just talk real quick about JSON. JSON is a way that typically JavaScript developers, but now it's been all sorts of different developers are using it. Um, it's a way that we structure data so that we can save it to anything. But, but let's just pretend we're going to save it to a file. Or, or let's say that we're going to take that um, same data structure that we would have saved to a file, and we're just going to pass it back and forth between two different um, applications. So hey, so I used to, yeah. Um, the right part of your screen is cut off just a little bit. I was wondering maybe you could shrink it oh, just a hair. Like, I don't know like what's going on. Oh, you did it. It, it. Whatever you did worked. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. Sorry about to interrupt you. Thank you. No, that's okay. That's all right. So, so in the early 2000s, if we wanted to have two applications talk to each other through a web service, through like a SOAP service or something like that, we would have used um, XML. And um, people, when XML first came out, people loved it, but as they started working with it, they just realized it was really cumbersome. Like, you had to, like, have uh, begin tags and closing tags. You had to have, like, the tags in the right order. Um, that things would get messed up with the tag order. Sometimes when you did nesting, the document would just look super funny and you couldn't read anything out of it. Um, and it just became, like, a kind of an arduous way of, of dealing with data. And so this guy named Douglas Crockford came out with JSON. He was a chief Java guy at um, Yahoo. And he, 
he said, wait, we don't need all of this ceremony in XML, all these begin tags and end tags and data types and all this nonsense. All we need is like a few data types that we all agree with, like the American string and a couple like that. And we just need to describe it. Like, what is that piece of data? And so if you see over here on the right side of my screen, you'll see like first name is the name of the field, and then the colon, and then the value of the field is John. And, and this is typically on the right side of the screen, typical JSON that, that developers use all the time. Um, notice that the data in JSON is hierarchical. Like notice that we can say like, okay, this is John Smith, and then, oh, he has two phone numbers. And what are those phone numbers? Well, his home number is 212555 whatever, and his office number is 646 whatever, right? He doesn't have any children and he doesn't have a spouse. So, you look at this JSON document and you don't even have to be a data guy, you don't have to be a developer, you can kind of glance at that and understand that there is data here and it's describing it and it's giving you the values there. Um, it's very brief and easy to read and it, and it lends itself to preserving the data in the natural hierarchy that developers always think about. They, they, to a developer, Developers don't think about data the way you and I think about data, right? You and I as data guys, we think about data in tables where we flatten them in tables and then we relate those tables together and we use primary keys and foreign keys to preserve those relationships and we think about link tables for many-to-many -many relationships. Developers never think about a link table or a many-to-many -many relationship. They think of a natural hierarchy just like this, meaning if I have a John, if I have a person object, it should tell me everything I want to know about John Smith. It should tell me his job, it should tell me his, where he lives, it should tell me um, who his parents are, it should tell me if he has a boss. Anything that I know about John should be found in the John object, and I really shouldn't have to navigate to any other object in order to find that. Well, saving all that data in the, in the person object into a table in a relational database like SQL Server creates this type impedance. And and that's why we have all of these ORMs and things like that that have released in the last, you know, eight years or so, like um, Entity Framework or in Hibernate, is it in order to kind of bridge the gap between the impedance of the hierarchy of an object model and, and the relational data. And so what DocumentDB strives to do is say, look, we don't need an ORM to save the hierarchy into a relational database. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to save the hierarchy in its native format. Which, which for most developers is increasingly being JSON. So what they would do, what a developer would do, is they would take their object model and all the hierarchy of all their objects, and they would run it through a JSON serializer. And the JSON serializer just says, hey, all these objects that you have right here, it looks like this in JSON. And then once you've run it through a JSON serializer, you can hand it through an API to another application. You can serialize it to just a text file on disk and read it out of the text file if you want. Or you can just save it natively in DocumentDB. And that's what DocumentDB is. DocumentDB at its core is a JSON document storage system. It's just a way to store JSON documents and preserve that hierarchy. That's it. Nothing fancy. It's a way, and once you store them, you know as data guys that we have all the other things that go along with storing them, right? We have to we have to be able to update those documents. We have to be able to insert new documents. We have to be able to query those documents and retrieve them. And, and if we want to query them quickly, you know, we're going to index, right? And just like we index in SQL Server, we're going to index in DocumentDB. But, but the difference is um, with SQL Server where it's all heavily relational and the data guys love that, the developers don't love it. And so developers would choose to use DocumentDB because they they want to avoid the pain of learning, um, you know, how they're actually going to translate all this data correctly. Um, now, I've got a blog. Does that make sense, Rob? Was yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. It's, it's just a different way. And, and I didn't know about this at all, so I find it really interesting, you know? Okay, because good I, I'm really, I can relate with the data, you know, the relational tables and the one to many and the many to many and et cetera. But with the programming I'm not I'm not a really a programmer, so it really explains to me with the objects and how everything about a person all relates to that person. You know? Well I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna show you that in code in about fifteen minutes. Oh that's great. Yep, you're gonna see it. Yep. So 
So real quick, um, I've got a blog post in my head. I think I need to write it. And, and that blog post is going to be called Type Impedance is Unavoidable, right? Like what we have is all the data guys like the multiple tables and the relationships, right? And all the developers, they like, you know, the hierarchy, right? And yeah. so what they do is they say, well, we shouldn't have type impedance, so we're just going to use a NoSQL database, right? But, but I promise you, eventually somebody's going to want that data in a table. And, and if you store all your data in DocumentDB, at some point, someone is going to ask, can I have all that data in Excel, right? And the minute you do that, you are now deciding how you're going to break apart that hierarchy and flatten it out and relate it so you can put it in Excel so that you can have pivot tables and charts and all this stuff, right? So if, yeah. you, take, if you take data from end to end, which is from like conception to storage to, to use to analytics, right, I think that there's like a permanent imp type impedance there, impedance mismatch there. Like, I think that you, what you're doing when you decide to use DocumentDB is you're just making it someone else's problem as a developer, right? Now, it's fair. If you and I were writing an application, Rob, like you, were, you and I were writing Tinder or we were writing like Clash of Clans or we were writing, you know, some mobile app that was only on our phones where all the reporting would be done on our phones and, and, and we would be in charge of the data from end to end, then like a NoSQL, a, docu a JSON document store makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because we don't care about the, you know, there aren't any analysts. But if you're writing, like most of us are writing LOB applications, LOBs, like line of business applications, where you work for Blue Cross, right? Those guys, you have a teams of analysts, right? And oh, you're right. Those analysts, right. Yeah. Those analysts aren't going to learn JavaScript, right? They, they need that data and they need to pull it out somehow. So, so there's a, that impedance is always going to exist, isn't it? And, and anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but that's my blog post idea. I should really write that. Um, so if you look at the Azure data landscape, we have three main projects if you're running a transactional system. We have Azure SQL, which is SQL Server in Microsoft Azure that you can start at $5 a month and start you know, storing data in there right now. Um, you have DocumentDB, which is what I've been describing, this JSON document store. And you have Azure Table Storage, which is a, it's a key value store that allows us to just store key value data um, in large amounts. And, um, and then you have like Azure Blob Storage, which is for you know, saving binaries and Word documents and PDFs and all sorts of other data, logs and things like that. So Azure SQL is the relational data. Um, just like SQL Server, at where we have multiple tables and we have columns and we have indexes and sort of procedures and triggers and all that stuff. And when you write sort of procedures and triggers, you're going to write them in Transact SQL. DocumentDB is the JSON document store that I've been talking about. And um, in that, we actually do have triggers for procedures and functions in DocumentDB, but instead of writing them in Transact SQL, we write them in JavaScript. And I'll show you what a store procedure looks like in JavaScript by the end of the session. And then we have Azure Table Storage, which doesn't have any server-side programmability. It's just um, interacting with um, a REST API um, and an SDK um, on the, like if you're writing an Azure website or something like that, you can store it in Azure Table Storage. Now, now do you guys want to hear something that's 100% opinion? Um, sure. This is me just totally guessing, okay? When Azure SQL Server first came out, it had a really hard time under high load where most data architects thought that Azure SQL kind of folded at around 70 transactions a second. And so a lot of the guys that had high load systems go to the cloud because they don't want to have to deal with elasticity and fault tolerance and all the nonsense. They just want to be able to say, oh, we're growing, you know, grow it, right? And they, and they, they didn't like Azure SQL's database really at the beginning because of that. So a lot of them were creating systems using Azure Table Storage because Azure Table Storage can have lots of transactions per second and not fold. And so they would create these like, oh, we're going to take our JSON documents and we're going to store them in Azure Blob Storage and then we're going to use Azure Table Storage as our indexes over the documents we're already storing in Azure Blob Storage. And they would have to write all this, all this code that really didn't have anything to do with creating an application, it was mostly just so they could get the high throughput. 
And we call that code as software developers, we call that plumbing. And developers hate writing plumbing because they're like, why do I have to write this code? This thing should be done for me already. And I really think that's why DocumentDB was released last September. Because DocumentDB does perform well under high load. Thousands of transactions a second. And, it, and you can index it, and you don't have to write all the plumbing that you would have had to write if you were going to do the same solution in Azure Table Storage. Now, something has changed since then. And that is that Azure SQL Database has been re-released and the old editions are getting retired end of life and there's new editions and what those new editions allow us to do is they allow us to scale. Do you guys know this? Where you could have like a, a standard edition and a premium edition of Azure SQL Database and instead of just doing storage, now Azure SQL Database does what they call a database, a data unit, data transaction unit or DTU I think is what they're calling it, where they're, they have an SLA saying yeah, we can handle up to 732 transactions per second and not fold. Um, so that's significant, but you pay for that. I mean, every time you say, hey, I want something faster, you pay a little bit more money. But, um, but I think that originally they were like, oh my gosh, we have to have something that bears under high load that developers love. And I think that's why, you know, it, that's all my opinion and me guessing. But, but anyway. Okay. So this right here is some vocabulary related to um, Azure Document DB. Um, first off, you have a database account that maps to um, your Azure account. You just created a database account, and inside that database account, you can have um, multiple databases. And inside a database, you can have multiple collections. And inside a collection, you can have JSON documents. Now, this is the weird thing for most data guys to get their head around, and that is that these documents do not have a particular schema. So one document could be related to employees, while another document is related to customers, while another document is related to customers and all their orders. You know, the, and maybe another document is related to a calendar event, right? And we don't necessarily have to store each one of those documents in their own collection we could store them all in one collection if we wanted to. So that scares um, data guys, right? Because data guys are like, no, no, before we write an application, we need to spend like two months figuring out the schema and have a ton of meetings. Um, and what developers are increasingly doing is they're saying, no, no, I don't want to write schema. I, I just want to kind of write code and, and, and worry about the schema later. <laughs> Which, as data guys, we're like, worry about the schema later, that's like, flies in the face of 30 years of data science, but um, for, for a developer, they're like, well, every time I try to guess schema, I guess wrong. And so instead, I just want to kind of write code, write code, write code in the moment, and then at the end of it, look at my data and see if it looks good or not, and if it doesn't, I'll change it. And so as they're writing code, writing code, writing code, they just want a place to kind of shove that, that um, data to preserve it without having to serialize it to disk, which is why they're using DocumentDB or MongoDB or any of the JSON document stores. So, so what that means is that they can kind of decide on schema later, um, later down the pipe. And the, and the reason why that's attractive to them is because it doesn't slow down their creative ability as they're writing applications to sit down and think things too far into the future, which they have found they're not very accurate at doing anyway. In fact, if you guys, you and I talk about like, you know, doing it our way, which is that we would write schema first, and then we'd write the application over the schema, you know, how many of you have tables in your databases that are never used? Ooh. How many of you have columns in a table? Maybe there's 300 columns in a table, and let's say 50 of them are just straight nulls. So if you have those dark spots in your data, that's you, that's, that's a product of you predicting the future and being wrong, right? Like you thought there'd be data there and the developers and users thought otherwise, they thought it was irrelevant, right? So this method says, well, we don't want any dark spots in our data. What we want is we want the data store to evolve as the application evolves. And, and that's what, um, not worrying about schema at the beginning allows a developer to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, to me, yes. In, in addition, documents can have attachments in JSON. So if you have a JSON document and then all of a sudden you have like some, you know, 
some binary data, like you're like, oh, we're keeping data on employees in JSON, and then we want to store their resume. You know, maybe their resume is an attachment that you can store inside of um, DocumentDB. So um, just to kind of go back to recover some main vocabulary, you have the database account that um, you can decide how much scale you have on the database account, how much um, storage that you put on it, and how much performance you put on it. You have a database, and a database will store collections, and a collection will store JSON documents. And a database can have multiple collections, and a single collection can have multiple JSON documents. So there's one other kind of wrench to throw in here, and that is something called the capacity unit. A capacity unit is what determines your scaling, um, meaning how, many, how much data you can store, and how many transactions per second you can handle, and how much data you can hand back and forth to people. So the capacity unit is what determines how much you pay for DocumentDB, and it determines what performance you get out of DocumentDB. So right now, it's $22 and some change, $22.65 per capacity unit, and you can have up to 50 capacity units per database account. Um, each capacity unit is 10 gigs. So that brings us to some of our preview quota things that you need to know. You can have up to five database accounts. Um, you can have 100 databases per database account. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you guys read this. We don't need to go over each one. Um, and I kind of just talked about kind of the most important ones. But I just wanted you to know that this is that you are given these limits um, because this is still in preview and we're still trying to, you know, figure out things like multi-tenancy and whether or not we're responsive enough to applications and whether or not we're getting, you know, good query response time and things like that, and whether or not we're elastic enough. Um, and so we're still learning and I think a lot of that learning is the reason why it's still in preview. Um, but if you have a massive application that's going to grow beyond this, you can call Microsoft and get some of these limits lifted for you. Um, they just, you know, want to have a kind of a baseline for people as they play with it and as they get apps on it, but don't think about this as a limiting thing. It's, it's possible to work around some of these limits. Uh, we already covered that. Okay, let's talk about configuration. So, first off, do we have any questions yet, Rob? Oh, we sure do. Um, oh, okay. Uh, let's see. So um, the first question is, what are the major differences between DocumentDB and MongoDB? Um, MongoDB yeah. has extensions for JSON standard. Is DocumentDB going to keep up with MongoDB or, or do its own thing? Um, that's a great question. I can tell you that the team is very aware of MongoDB and the team made some design decisions differently than Mongo did. And one thing I do like about this team, and I've met with them several times, is they are the right balance between, between idealists and, and pragmatic practitioners. So um, you don't want people too pragmatic, because then they start making, they just start trying to accommodate everybody, right? And you don't really want that, because then there's no cohesive vision. And you don't want somebody who's so tied to a cohesive vision that they, they don't respond to the field, right? So in one case, like MongoDB only allows one type of JSON document per collection, and um, DocumentDB doesn't. DocumentDB um, allows multiple types of, you know, they're really committed to being schemaless and not caring about the schema. Um, and then as far as whether or not they're going to release JSON extensions, I don't, I don't know. They've, they've gotten some pressure about some new data types, um, and I think they are going to respond to that. Anything else? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so this next question is about DocumentDB, and they're asking, is it a NoSQL database? Yes, it is. Yep, okay. it absolutely is. Yeah, but you know what NoSQL means, right? NoSQL doesn't mean it's not SQL. NoSQL means it's not only SQL. So um, I don't want you to think it, they embrace SQL. And, and a lot of it, do you remember my little kind of tangent earlier where I talked about that um, impedance between um, like the business analysts and the developers and uh, somebody has to bridge that. Usually it's the data guys that bridge that. Well, um, the, the team knows that. 
and they know that a lot of the analysts have a lot of um, investment into SQL as a language, and they don't as JavaScript. And so they release their own version of SQL that allows us to pull data out of DocumentDB using SQL syntax that is comfortable to most people. So, and this is a common thing, right? Like Hadoop did this with Hive and, and, and Pig to a certain extent. And then, um, and, you know, PDW was the MPP that Microsoft released that's built on SQL Server. And, and then DocumentDB has a SQL similar language. Like, they know this. They know that, hey, SQL as a language spans report authors and analysts and a new, hey, the, Rob, there's a new job I just heard of last week called the data creative. They, they don't even know much about data, they just do the visualizations, but they still know SQL as a language. And then DBAs and developers, and, and so Microsoft is really committed to, um, you know, capitalizing on that ubiquitous nature of SQL as a language. So, so I'll show you that in the demo a little bit later. Okay. All right, and we have one last question here. And um, let's see if I can read this. Oh, would I be right in saying a collection is a schema, a document is a table, and an attachment is a file stream collect column? No. Okay. That's close. Most most developers, and they do it a little bit incorrectly, think of a collection as a table, and the document as a row in the table. But the, where that falls down is that we can have multiple types of documents in the same collection. So although maybe that's not ideal, and maybe you know, as a data architect on a development team, maybe you decide not to do that. Maybe you decide to do that. You know, people make their own decisions. But um, that's, the, that's how they kind of map it in their head. Where that falls down is that in DocumentDB, we do, as the last time I checked, we do not have cross-collection joining. So in the SQL syntax, which would mean we would want to be careful storing different data in different collections if we couldn't get it out in one round trip. Okay, that was it. Okay, great. Okay, so let's say that I'm brand new to um, DocumentDB. This is, um, this is the Azure portal. Notice that this portal is in preview. Can you see that green bar right up there? Yes. Um, yeah, so this is the new portal. A lot of people, some people hate this portal. I actually really like this portal. I think it's pretty. It's a little slow sometimes, but for the most part, I like it. If I want to create a DocumentDB um, database, I just click New, and then I click Everything. And then underneath Everything, I can click Data and Analytics. And then right down here, I've got DocumentDB. And it says, oh, you want to create something? Yeah, I do. Okay. So I click Create. And I can type like what I want this to be. I can say I want this to be Ike um, pass demo. And then um, did I, let's see. I don't know why you're giving me a pink, but I think that's okay. Um, one capacity unit, remember capacity unit controls scale and pricing. And then um, I can choose the location, and in my case, I can just say I want it in the Western United States. Now, notice in my location, not all data centers have DocumentDB in them yet. It's growing. It's growing, but some of them don't have it quite yet. So I'll go ahead and click Western US. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, Hang on one second. Let me go ahead and click create one more time. Okay. Um, now, rather than kind of wait the 10 minutes to create a document DB database, I actually already have one created. So if I click browse, you can see mine if you click on document DB accounts. And I've got this one called flashcard that I've already created. And then inside this uh, database, you can see a few things about it, right? Um, you can see that, you know, some, you know, how many requests I'm getting per day. You can see how much spend I have so far this month. Um, you can see how many capacity units I have. And then 
And then you can actually see if I've stored anything inside the flashcard database. So if I click Document Explorer, you can see if anything's stored in here. And at the moment, I don't have anything stored. I do have a database called Conferences. And inside that database, I have a collection called Fall Conferences. But inside the Fall Conferences collection, I don't have anything quite yet. But um, we're going to play with this, and we're going to, in the demo, kind of walk back and forth between Document Explorer and Code. So I don't know how many people are developers here. I'm kind of operating under the assumption that most of you are not developers. So I'm, the code might seem a little basic to people who are used to C-sharp, but I wanted to kind of explain it um, so that non-developers could understand, uh, assuming that we're all from past, right? So, so real quick, hang on, let me get the GoToMeeting out of the way. This is my code. I don't know, Rob, can you see Solution Explorer? Is that in the right spot? It's on the right. I do see it, yes. You do? Okay, all right. Yeah. So what I want you to see is that in my code, I have these models that I wrote. A lot of this code I wrote, right? And this code, like, this is a typical class. This is the conference class. And you can see that in C Sharp, my conference has an ID and a name and a start date and an end date and then sessions, right? And then when I create the conference, I create a new person as an attendee and I give that person a name and an employer. So that person object looks like this. It's just real simple. It has two properties called name and employer, and they're both strings. They're, so if I go back to conferences, you can see this attendee is this person with the name and employee. OK. And then once I've got this conference, um, I can create a new conference. And I can give that conference a start date and a start um, and an end date. And then I can give it sessions. And a session looks like this. Excuse me. It's just the name of the session, the start date of the session, the topic, and the speaker, and who's attending it. So if I go back to where I'm going to create a conference, you can see I've got a new session. I name it, you know, real creatively. I take the argument, you know, conference one, session one, and then I give it a start date, and then I give it uh, the topic, conference one, topic one. I just did kind of generic stuff. And then I assign a speaker like these guys, speaker one, speaker two right here on line 37. And then I give it attendees. And this attendee is just an array of attendees. So I say, well, the people coming to this, this first session are attendee one and two. The second session are attendee two and three. And then the third session is just attendee three. But there are arrays. I could have like 100 guys in here if I wanted. There's no limit here. Um, and you can kind of see just in my code how I wrote this code. You can see the natural hierarchy already there in code. And C Sharp developers write code that looks like this from lines like 49 all the way to 85. They write code like this all day. And when they glance at their data, this is how they visualize it. And maybe as data guys, seeing how developers look at data might help you communicate with them um, as they're trying to like decipher what you're angry about and why, you know why you don't like that they have an n plus 1 problem in a store procedure or something like that. OK. Um, so now that you kind of see the data, let's just kind of walk through um, interacting with DocumentDB. Now, before you get too into it, um, in DocumentDB, I have to have what's called a DocDB endpoint and a DB key. And that is like a security mechanism that allows me to connect to my DocumentDB in the cloud and with the right URL and with the right key so that I can start adding data to it. And so um, if I wanted to know what those keys were, all the way up here, you could kind of see under keys, it will tell you what they are. Um, so I'm not going to click this because I don't want that video to pass for all time and eternity. But, but what I did in order to kind of preserve my URI and my key is I saved it in my app config folder. And so, and I did that only in my demo so that I can hide it from you guys. Not that I don't trust you, I'm sure you're great people, but um, it's those other guys I don't trust. So um, I'll show you what that looks like, but basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the endpoint and the key out of app config and I'm loading it into these two variables. And then you'll see me use that um, as I create a new document client um, I'll ask for, you see how that's my URI, 
um, that kind of hovered over there, flashcard.documents.azure.com. That's my URI, and then my key is the other one. This is part of the DocumentDB API. So this is called the document client. Apologize for the ringing phone. So I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint right there, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this line by line. Excuse me. Let me stop that. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is call a procedure that I created right here in my code called run create demo async. And I created this docdb utils class. So I don't want you to get confused with the API in my code, so I'll kind of illustrate when it's my code. So I'm going to create a new docdbs class that I wrote and hand the client in. And it just says, okay, find that client. And then now let's go find the conferences um, database. And so I'm going to call my, I wrote this git or create the database async. And what it looks like is this. It just says, hey, take that client that had the URI and the, and the key that I showed you earlier and call this create database query procedure and find out if there is a database there with, with an ID of conferences. And if there is, return it. And if there isn't, create it. And that's what's going to happen here. So it's going to return it. And then it's going to do a null check. Does that exist? And in this case, it does exist. If it didn't exist, it would call, again, this is part of the docdb SDK, the create database async procedure with a new ID. And what was that ID? It was just conferences. Now, the reason why I didn't create it is because we know this. We went down to Document Explorer, and we can see that's the database conferences that it's trying to create right now. It just already existed. That makes sense so far? Oh, yeah. Even though you're not a coder? No, I follow you. I used to code years ago. It's been a long nice. time. So. Okay, so that creates the database. Now we're going to follow the exact same pattern to create the collection. Now, I want you to notice that what I did was I hand in the URI of the database account to create the database, and then I hand in the URI of the database in order to create um, the conference. So when I come in here, I'm on line 35 right now, it says, hey, on 35, Go find what, you know, look at this database that you have here and, and tell me if there's a collection called fall conferences. And go ahead and return it to me. And the way we return it is we do this like first or default right here. Like go return fall conferences to me. If you find it, so do the null check, um, skip. If you don't find it, um, then go ahead and create it. And the way we create it is we take the database link, the URI, and then we say, please give me a new document collection, and the ID that I want is fall conferences. Now, it skipped that line of code because, if we come back here, that collection, fall conferences, already existed. It was already there. Okay, so we go ahead and return that. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to create some documents now. So we've got the database account. We've got the database, we've got the collection, and now that we've got the collection, we can now begin putting some JSON in it, right? And what are we going to do? Well, let's step into it. Hey, remember this code? This was that hierarchy that's coming back, right? So I'm going to return that conference back, and then I'm just going to call my create document procedure that says, hey, take the collection URI, take the document, and just save it for me, please. Now, if we, if we look at... Um, the document, look at this is what it looks like in memory. Does this look familiar, you guys? This is, this is currently what's in memory for that JSON document. And then when I save it, look what happens. I can go back to Document Explorer. I can refresh, and now that document is what I just stored. And when I click on it, it shows it to me, and that is JSON. It just serialized those objects out to JSON and it stored it into DocumentDB. Okay, so let's continue. So you just watched me do it for conference one. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make you sit through the code for conference two and conference three, but you're gonna have to trust me that I did it. Well, you don't have to trust me actually. We can just refresh. Look, conference two, conference two, and conference three. Cool, huh? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and go past this. Okay, we can run our finalized code. And now 
I'm going to comment this out. Now that you've seen me put documents in there, I want you to see all the different ways we can query documents out. So this is just selecting. Not all the different ways, but some of the cool ways we can query documents out. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing we did before, right? We're going to say, okay, give me a new document DB util. You saw that code. Give me the conference database. Give me the fall conferences collection. So you saw this code, remember? This is us, you know, first get the database account URI, then get the database URI, then get the conference URI, then get, then, you know, now um, get, go get the collection URI. And once we have the collection URI, we can say, hey, run this, I wrote this query all. And query all looks like this. Look, do you guys recognize line 77? That's link code. It just says, hey, from, from the conference collection, go to client create document query conference collection, give me everything in there. And then once we have it in link, we can just kind of loop through it. And in my case, I'm just looping through and getting the name here. And I just run through this three times to get all the conferences in the collection. And what did that do? If I go to my command window, you could see found conference one, two, and three. So that, that's, that's for a developer, do you see how simple that code is? There's no entity framework. There's no, you know, creating T-SQL code. It's just it, um, one of the great things about this versus T-SQL is I get auto list members when I type this out. So um, there's IntelliSense when I type it out. So it just makes it super easy for me to find the stuff I want. And then once I have it, look, at you, um, I feel like, you know what, I feel like I'm going to put the breakpoint right here and I'm going to stop so I can show you what's cool about this. It's from a developer. If I go conference.name, right, I have everything that I want here, conference.sessions. Do you see why developers love this? Because they can kind of find exactly what they want. Or I can say, give me the first session. You know what, do you want the attendees? Yeah, give me the, or that's the second session. Give me the first attendee. And then which attendee do you want? Oh, I want, I want their employer name. So for me to like find the data I'm looking for, I'm not like scouring through tables, trying to figure stuff out. It's all strongly typed and easy for me to find once it's retrieved. Okay, I'll leave that there. All right, so that, that was me querying everything. Um, let's see. Didn't I set a breakpoint? Let's do that again. Let's run in. Okay, I'm going to shift out of this. Yeah. Oh, you know what it is? I am not hitting that second breakpoint. Hang on one second. I thought I did it from the calling code, but I did it from down here. Sorry. Um, there we go. Okay. So now um, what I want, instead of just getting all the conferences, I want to just get conference one. And so I'm, here's the code for that. So I wrote this code. So it says, hey, go get the query, right? Where, what is it, conference one? Where the conference.name equals conference one. So just go get that one. And then once you have it, loop through it. And it's only going to loop one time. So it looped one time, and how do we know it looped? It's because of right here, found conference one at, you know, starting 10-18-2014 at 8 a.m. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now let's go get conference sessions. So the reason why I wrote this query is because I wanted you to see the SQL syntax. I've been showing you link syntax. But you don't have to use link in order to query it. What you can do is you can say, hey, create a document query, um, and instead of the link, just do select star from conferences where the start date equals the start date I'm looking for, in this case, November 1st, 2014. And when I click F11, it says, I know what conference starts in 2014. And it shows those three conferences starting you know, uh, greater than, greater than that date. So cool, huh? And that's kind of the beginnings of the SQL syntax. Okay. 
So now that you've seen that, let's run, let that run through. And let's take a look at what an update looks like. So just so you know, let's go back to my collection. You know, I'm not pre-baking the turkey here, right? I've got three documents here, conference one, and that's on line three, conference two on line three, and conference three on line three. Okay, let's go back to code. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay, now same thing, right? Go get the, de the database, go get the um, collection for the database, and now go get a specific document for conference one, and I'm, doing, I'm using link to get this, right? Find the document where c.name equals conference one. C sharp uses double equals for equality operators. JavaScript uses triple equals. T SQL uses single equals. It's a confusing world I live in. So um, then we'll say, okay, take that conference and then edit the name to conference one edited. And then once you've got the name, use this line 121 replace document to take that edited name and replace it over the previous document. And then once you've done that, that's the replace document async. Then once you've done that, query for it again and prove that you found it. And so what happened? You get this found conference, conference one edited. Now let's go back to the Azure Management Portal. Let's refresh this. And here you'll see conference one edited. It did persist that. And now let, let's go back to that code real quick, you guys. Do you see how easy it is for me to go grab something? Ignore the first three lines. That's generic, right? Only the, the meat of this is right here, which is go get it, change it, and save it. To a developer, this replace document async is like hitting the save button in Microsoft Word, right? And I want you to remember the power of this because this is the true power of DocumentDB. The only thing I did was retrieve a document change something and save the document just like I would in Word. What would happen in a relational data store if I wanted to save something? I would have to think about like parent-child relationships, right? Oh, we have to save the customer before we save the orders. You know, oh, we have to make sure that the orders are there before we start making order line items, right? Order matters in, in a relational database because of the foreign key relationships. And so for a developer, if they've got a 50 tables, that's a lot to keep track of, and they do it wrong all the time, don't they? But in DocumentDB, they just like save it as a document, and they never think about what order it needs to be saved in or anything like that. It just saves and persists, and they can go get it anytime they want. Okay. There's power there. Do you guys see the power there? Yeah. I have a few questions if you want to break for a minute. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, sure. Um, well, the first question I see here is um, they're, ask, they're saying Mongo has recently announced that it will be fully ACID, and they want to know if DocumentDB will be ACID compliant. Um, so that's a good question, and I wonder what Mongo means by being fully ACID. So to me that means a lot of things, right? Like are they talking about consistency? Are they saying like, hey, when I save the data, do I see the data that I saved? And um, DocumentDB has always had, in my opinion, better methods at managing consistency than Mongo has. So Mongo's gotten digged because data sometimes falls into a black box. And in DocumentDB, I don't believe that they've had the similar problems. Now whether or not that qualifies as ACID, I'm not sure you can say that a database is fully ACID if it um, allows you to adjust its consistency levels, right? Like, yeah. um, like you know, SQL Server would never let you adjust the consistency levels, right? Like, if, cons if SQL Server says something's written, you should be able to retrieve it, right? Um, but um, in the NoSQL stores, you know, that's a little looser. Okay. Let's see, what's the next question here? Um, does DocumentDB have transactional support? Um, that's a good question. Um, like, four, like four documents get stored together or none of them do? Uh, 
I can take a guess, like you know, like a bit a begin transactional uh, commit or rollback. That's what I think about when they say transactional. You know, I've never seen rollback trans syntax in DocumentDB, but I I'll look that up. And then, can I just give you the information, Rob, and you can post it to you then? Sure, I'll, I'll post it and put it out there. Okay. Um, we'll go from there. Um, let's see. Here's one. Um, they're asking about index documents. Um, how would they go about indexing documents when there's not a schema? So this is like the black magic of DocumentDB. DocumentDB says that they handle all the indexing for you, and you don't need to specify what gets indexed. They will do it for you. Now, document you no know, indexing does control you know how much space it takes on disk and performance. So there's there are ways to opt fields out of indexing and say we don't need that. Um, unfortunately, the indexing syntax happens at collection creation, um, which means that if you need to change indexing, you need to do it when you change the collection when you create a new collection. So Mongo had has had in the past the same problem where. Um, you specify the indexing at collection creation. You fill. You realize you did something wrong. You have to create a new collection and then move all your documents over, which is kind of a pain, and you know could potentially have downtime and things like that. Now the guys know that that's an issue. Whether they address that or not, I don't know, but they're definitely aware that it's an issue. Okay. All right. Um, let me. I'm, I'll let you continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got four <laughs> minutes left, so let me um, get through the demo. So um, let's go ahead and run a delete, just so you can see the delete. The delete happens probably the way you would think it happens, which is, hey, go get the database account, go get the database, go get the collection, go get all the documents, and then once you have all the documents, go ahead and delete them all. And so same query, right? We've seen, we've seen lines 130 to 138 before, but now when we loop through it, we just say, hey, delete, delete this document. Um, and then... It deletes all three documents, and then we can come back here and refresh and notice no documents are in there anymore. Okay, so let me uh, hit my key. All right. Um, so last, I want to just show you a stored procedure just so you can see the funny syntax from a data perspective. So hit my key there, hit start, go in. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually creating a stored procedure that's going to create a document for me. And again, I do the same code that I've done before. I grab um, the database, grab the co collection, and then um, once I have the collection, this is my code to create a new stored procedure. And what you'll notice is this function, that's JavaScript right there. And it takes an argument, the document to create, and then it says, okay, inside the procedure, get the context, get the collection. This is all server-side code. Then create the document um, off the collection self-link, hand the document to create parameter, in to create the document, and then test to make sure it got created, and then hand it back to the user. So um, once, that, once that syntax has been created for a store procedure, I can just add the store procedure to the collection. And then once the store procedure is there, I can first get a conference. Hey, we know this code, right? That hierarchy data, right? Get a collection. Then execute the store procedure and hand the collection as an, an, as an argument. And now test to make sure that the um, conference was actually found and that it actually got saved. And if we go back, you can see that, yep, it did get found. And if we go back, and refresh, you can see this is the conference for the one I created with the stored procedure here. And it's been an hour. I'm out of time. Let me get, run through the slides. I kind of, um, yes, I went on too many tangents, but um, we know about creating stuff. The SDK can be pulled down from NuGet. Oh, there's a common error that people get all the time on the forums. Um, you have to make sure that your Azure clock and your local PC clock are synced and that they are synced correctly or it, it used to be within a minute. I think they're going to loosen that up. Um, if, if you get this error authorization token's not valid, it's because your local laptop is out of sync. Um, and then this is my contact information. You can also get me at um, ike at craftingbytes.com for the San Diego software company. And then, um, you know, just Google me. I'm all over Google if you want to see my blog and 
call me, email me. It's pretty easy. Um, always looking to make new friends. And uh, you know, if you see me at SQL Pass, the Business Analytics Conference, stop me and say hi. Or if you see me um, in the fall conference for the main conference, I'll probably be speaking there again. Uh, stop me and say hi. I'm glad to meet you guys. And hopefully you had a good hour and that this was a good use of your time. Thanks. Hey, I. Yeah. So um, I have a few questions, and I'm going to forward them off to you uh, later today, and we can send the answers back to them, okay? Sounds great. That, and that way uh, we can get – it's not many, but we have maybe a few, and we'll, we'll, we'll answer everyone's question. Again, the recording, we have a recording, and we keep it at the Data Architecture Chapter Pass. And I have my blog, which is SQLTigers.com. I, I post it there, too. So there's two locations of, the, uh, of this video. And I just want to thank Ike and thank everyone that took time out today to join us on this webinar for PASS. And, uh, you know, it's great. Thank you, Ike, again. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thanks, Rob. Thanks a ton. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, we're going to shut it down now. Y'all all have a great day. Bye.